Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> Happy to be back up here again for a second time as we wrap up a really special international purchasing conference. So once again, my name is Omid Gamami, and it's always a pleasure to be in front of a group of large chief pur purchasing officers and directors in the country of Turkey. What I'd like to talk about is investigative negotiations and value creation. I'm trying to focus on topics that I know make a difference in working with companies and in the public sector as well. Uh, and so that's really the genesis for this discussion. I won't go through my biography once again. You've heard it once before. Um, so, <clears throat> but suffice it to say that I'm passionate about help making this profession better. I wanted to focus on this particular topic because we have a problem in negotiations. We have a problem in that there's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Many times we go into a negotiation, and perhaps most of the time, we go into it saying, the supplier wants our money, we're going to be fighting over the money, and how do we negotiate? How do we make sure that we leave there giving away the least amount of money, and with the assumption that the supplier is at the same time saying, how do we get the most money out of this deal, and that this is their overriding objective? What happens, in fact, is if you believe this, if you say that the supplier's most important objective is to get the money, that's exactly what will happen. You will lay out the negotiation, the objectives, the topics that you discuss, and you will carry the negotiation in such a way that it will be all about the money. You'll be discussing the money and debating over the money, and then you will conclude that you are right. It was about the money. Uh, what I found, however, is this is very frequently untrue. It's very frequently untrue that the supplier is exclusively interested in how do they get your money, how do they get the most of your money while they still can during this negotiation. And so the purpose of this segment today is how do we find out what else is important to them besides just the money? And if we can find out what else is important to them, then we can find out ways to make the supplier satisfied without having to give them more money. Because that's the easy way to satisfy a supplier, isn't it? Anybody can offer to pay a higher price. The really good world-class negotiators know how to make a supplier really, really happy without having to pay them more. And so that's what we're going to focus on. <clears throat> um, there was probably the most famous economist in the United States, anyways, from the 20th century. His name was Milton Friedman. And he has a quote that I really like. He says, most economic fallacies derive from the tendency to assume that there is a fixed pie, that one party can only gain at the expense of another. <clears throat> so what he's saying here is really deep and it has complete application to our field of procurement. What it means is, if you assume that in order for me to gain, the other party must lose, then you've not advanced to the next level of negotiations. World-class negotiators understand that this is definitely not the case. It does not have to be that in order for you to gain, they must lose, and in order for them to gain, you must lose. And so, if we take a look at this simplified view of the supply chain, where you have your suppliers, suppliers, your supplier, you, your customer, your customers, customers, uh, this is called parasitic value creation. And what it means is, a supplier, you get a supplier, let's say you're getting a 15% discount, and you get a supplier to agree to a 12% discount. Well, where did that 3% go? In order for you to gain 3%, they had to lose 3% someplace. It's parasitic. You achieved a better negotiation result parasitically. And so that's different than what I'm going to be talking today. I'm going to be talking about how do we not just move costs back to the supplier, make them eat the costs, and then we claim victory. How do we instead develop strategies that are based on the supplier's very unique needs and requirements. You cannot assume you know what's important to a supplier. Um, and once you find out, and we do that how? Through investigative negotiations, which will be the topic here, 
you use that information to create ideas, to invent options that create value and create value for both parties so that it's no longer parasitic. So here's what happens now. The goal is to remove costs from the supply chain. This is everything I focus on. How do we take the costs that don't belong there or that we can streamline or that should have never been there, surgically remove them and take them out? Both parties win in this scenario. However, frequently we find ourselves fighting over profit. That little piece between you and the supplier that says, can you make 3% less? Can you make 4% less? It's supplier profit compression once again. And then what happens is you're moving costs. So if you achieve that 3% cost savings, the supply chain itself still did not change. The cost going through the supply chain did not change. You just parasitically benefited by 3%. So the other party would have to lose by 3% in order to support that. And so, before you embark on this kind of strategy, the first thing you have to do is you have to understand these three circles here. It's extremely important. In fact, this is not just for negotiations with suppliers. This is any kind of negotiation with anybody. <clears throat> what we have is issues, positions, and interests. And what it, it turns out that most people tend to focus on issues and positions in negotiations. And this becomes a fatal flaw. This becomes a fatal flaw that makes negotiations fall apart. With the issues, these are what the topics, the topics that the parties want to discuss. Lead time, pricing, warranty, inventory models, all of these kinds of things. Then you have the positions, which is where each party stands on those topics. I'll give you 2% lead time. I'll give you 18% discount. I'll have a vendor managed inventory model, whatever it is. And we tend to stop there. We send out the tender and we say, these are the things we want to discuss. Send you back, they send you back the response and they've responded to those things. Well, you've only covered issues and positions. You have not yet covered interests. <clears throat> The interests are the underlying needs and wants that are not readily evident. They're not evident. And I promise you the interests will never come out in a traditional negotiation. Interests never come up accidentally. They never come back in a bid response from a supplier. The only way you can get interests is if you dig deeper and you find out what is going on with them. It requires research. It requires questions. But the good thing is, this allows you to take the pie, this negotiation pie, and make it much bigger and to create other pies. And so the process of adding interest does not take much longer, but it can add so much tremendous value to the negotiations. <clears throat> I'd like to share with you an example here. This is the largest cut stone in the world. It's in Lebanon. Um, I was there on business and my client was nice enough to book me a tour for the day and one of the places we went to was to see this stone. Now this stone is at, at the bottom of a small canyon in the middle of this city, okay? And what's interesting is they thought for many years that this was the world's largest cut stone until they started digging around it. What you can't see is they found out the world's largest cut stone is actually underneath this one. So underneath one, this one, there's one that's even bigger than this. Now, for 40 years, for many years, nobody cared about this stone. And what happened was this became a trash dumping site. It was filled to the top with trash. And for 40 years, one man, just one man from the military was upset about this. And he said, this for Lebanon is a national treasure. Why do you throw trash on it? It's the world's largest cut stone. It's a thing of beauty. Still people threw trash. So for 40 years, he cleaned this. For 40 years, he had equipment with his own money. Every week, he would clean it out. He would go through the trash and look at the receipts to find out who put the trash. He'd go to their home and say, please stop throwing away the trash. Nobody stopped. For 40 years, he went to the government and said, please do something. And they said, we have bigger problems. Nobody stopped. After 40 years, for the very first time, because he was getting old and he was getting tired, 
he decided for the very first time to start asking people, why are you throwing away the trash here? He never asked why for 40 years. He only asked, he asked, well, he cleaned for 40 years. Finally, he asked people, what is the reason? What is the root cause that nobody will stop? What he found out was something so simple that he should have found out or asked 40 years ago. There was no trash service. There was no trash service for this city. And so what he decided to do was he created the trash pickup service. And he would go to everybody's home and pick up the trash and go and take it to a very far dump. And then the people who didn't have money to have their trash picked up, he would pick it for them too. But he'd just say, don't tell anybody, please. That little house that you see up there at the top is his now. And he uh, gives away souvenirs and he's so proud to have this place. But it took him 40 years to find out what were the interests of the people. For 40 years, he talked about the issues and positions. The issues were to dump trash or not to tra dump trash. And the positions of the people of the city were, we will dump trash. And his position was, we will not dump trash. The underlying interest was what was critical in solving this problem. People did not actually want to dump trash here. They just wanted to have a service, something that would take it away. They lacked that, and so they felt they had no other option but to fill this up. I'm indicating this story, I'm telling this story to you so you see how easy it is to go through the longest, most difficult negotiations and how you can, without ever talking about anything other than issues and positions. And then once you start getting into underlying interests, then you can have really big breakthroughs. Now this place is clean always. Another story. There was a medical development happening in London, and they had purchased this very large plot of land. And they had bought the land from so many different people. From their, They had gotten the people to sell their residences, and then they were going to put up this gigantic medical clinic, but one lady would not sell. She would not sell. And so the CEO said, well, offer her more money. And they kept offering her more money and offering her more money and offering her more money, and she still would not sell. It got to a point where they thought they could never give her enough money. And so what was happening was they were focusing on issues and positions. In fact, they assumed that they knew what the issues were and that they that and based on that they negotiated and they figured the issue was money and then how and the positions were she wanted much more and so they tried to keep meeting that need finally when the figures got so high the ceo said enough is enough and he went out personally to go meet with this little old lady and he said can you help me understand why you don't why you aren't selling your house how much do we need to give you and she said my husband died a long time ago i have enough money to live my life the only thing i have in my life today is my pets behind this house is my little dog she was buried there i cannot let you build a hospital on top of my dog and he said that's the issue why you're not selling and she said yes nobody had asked her why everybody assumed she wanted more money he said, you know what, how about if I have your dog very, very respectfully transported over to a very nice cemetery and I make the nicest pet cemetery you have ever seen for this dog, would that make you happy? She said that would mean the whole world to me. She didn't need all that money, she just needed her pet transported. Nobody, everybody assumed what the negotiations was about. It wasn't about the money, but everybody failed to ask her, so they never found out. It wasn't until somebody went and sat face to face with her that it came out, focusing on the interests. <clears throat> the state of Oregon has a very nice Capitol building, and they had a problem. The problem was at nighttime, they have lights everywhere around. It's not really a problem, it's beautiful. They have lights on the statues, lights on the trees, lights on the sides of the buildings. It's very, very nicely illuminated and largely ornamental. 
um, the problem was the state, the governor was telling everybody in the state, stop using so much electricity. We need to reduce electricity usage. Stop using so much. Meanwhile, they were using all this electricity to light up the capital. And so they thought, this doesn't look good. You know, it doesn't look good. We're telling everybody to use electricity and we use more than anybody else. And so they thought, okay, we should get solar. Well, that's an easy answer, except they didn't have money for solar. There was no money to go and put solar there. And so they thought about it and thought about it and said, you know, how can, how can we do this? Because if we want to put solar here, obviously the solar provider will want money to put it here. They thought about it some more and then they decided maybe there's things the solar providers value other than money. And so they publicized a bid that they said, come put solar all over the state capitol for free and we will advertise on our website for a short period of time and we will send out a couple of tweets indicating that you are the company that did the solar for the entire Oregon state capitol. Sure enough, all these companies lined up to lose money, to do this for free, just to have their name on the website for a couple of months someplace, and have to have two tweets sent out. For this, they were able to get solar. The point is, it was not limited to issues and positions being tied to money. The interests, once the underlying interests were understood, these suppliers were much more inter interested in advertising and getting their name out there and being affiliated with the government than they were in getting the money for solar. I've noticed recently, even in airport security, I don't think it's happened yet in Turkey, maybe you'll tell me it has, but in the United States, one airport after another after another is now starting to use these security bins as advertising and they're selling the space. Have you started to see this over here? It's <clears throat> everything, who says procurement cannot generate, be a revenue generator? We talked about some examples earlier, but there's really no end to how we can think about what satisfies suppliers? What are some of their unique requirements that we can fulfill in order to generate value for us and also for them without doing so parasitically? Here's a company called Agar. And what Agar does is they build um, commercial buildings, except they make them out of wood. It's a very unusual sort of line of business that they're in. It requires a special type of wood. They get the wood shipped. They receive it from two different suppliers. If I recall correctly, and I might be wrong, but if I recall correctly, these two suppliers are in Germany. Regardless, these suppliers are from out of the country. And Eger noticed that every time they would meet with one of the suppliers, the supplier had a presence there. This was also in Lebanon. The supplier had a presence there and they could meet at the office and so forth. But with the other supplier, they noticed every time they met with this other lumber provider, that the supplier would have to fly in and would come in only with their handbag or with their suitcase, but never was there an office. Uh, and Eger thought about it and thought about it. Meanwhile, they had developed this new customer center. You can see some pictures of it here. It was a very big center, state of the art. They had presentation rooms, they had demonstration rooms, they had seminar rooms, they had customer, all sorts of different rooms. And the utilization was very good, but it was not 100%. And they thought about it and thought about it and they realized what are this supplier's problems? The one that's flying in must be suffering with not having a presence here. Every time we want to meet them, they have to fly from their country to our country and then have many inconveniences as a consequence of not having a presence here. And so they went back to this supplier and said, is it a problem for you that you don't have a presence here, but you come here to do business? And they said, it's a tremendous problem. How did you know? Well, they said, because our other supplier has a presence here. And so we just assumed. And so Eger then said, did you know that we have this beautiful customer center set up? And if, would you like to use some of the rooms at times when we're not at full capacity? If you book in advance and you give us flexibility, would that be of interest to you? And this lumber supplier said, that would be tremendously beneficial to us. 
And then Agar said, and then what about, maybe you could use some of your wood to build the demo for us, like this, what you can see there. And then with this wood, you create a demo, we can use it, and you can use it too. You're showing off your lumber, we're showing off our structures. Would you want to do that? They said, we would love to do that. And so, is this something that would ever come about in a traditional tender process? Never. Is this something that would come about in a traditional negotiation? Never. Guess how much discount they got for allowing this supplier to use their customer center when they're not using it. Another 50% discount on top of the already aggressive discount schedule they were getting from this supplier they achieved. And so, <clears throat> This was probably their most expensive raw material component, and now on top of the very aggressive discount they have, they're getting another 50%. It's all because of investigative negotiations and paying attention to what problems does this supplier have, how can I help them, how can I create value for them, and then how can I get financial benefit in return in such a way that they're very, very happy about it. Now, this is a Turkish example. I left the company name out, uh, but you can probably guess who it is. There's a, uh, a very famous Turkish so uh, soft drink and uh, fruit juice company uh, here in Turkey. It's a global company, but they have a very strong presence here in Turkey. And they always bought their fruit and their sugar raw materials during the peak season, which only makes sense. That's pretty much when every such company buys their raw materials. Um, and then there was some problems. Uh, it, the costs were high because you buy when everybody else is buying, the, and there's a limited amount, and then the leverage is low because you're competing with everybody else. And then because of certain legislation that they're subject to, they could not source these raw materials from outside of Turkey. They had to buy it inside. And so that limited their options. Sourcing from the, another country was not an option. So what did they do? They started to speak with the suppliers to find out not what their own problems are, but what are the suppliers' problems? What is the supplier struggling with? What they found out was <clears throat> the supplier's income predictably had peaks and valleys. They had periods where they were making lots of money, then they had periods where they were making much less. And so what they agreed to do was to start making payments during the growth season. They said, what if we paid you when you're planting? And what if we paid you when it's the beginning of the season? What if we paid you when it's your lowest income season there is? Would that make a difference for you? They said that would really help us solve our problems. And so now they don't try to compete with everybody else to get the sugar and to get the pulp of the, and the fruit and all these things when they're ripe. They pay the money completely off season when these suppliers are only spending money and receiving very little income. As a consequence, they achieve two things. They the, they, the buying company, the soft drink and juice manufacturer, they were able to secure the allocation they needed and not have to worry about it come harvest time. That's A. B, they were able to get a much better pricing model than what they were getting before. And on top of that, they have a supplier that was eager to give a discount. This is so important because when you squeeze a supplier for profit, they're usually not eager. And Frequently, they figure out other ways to get their money. Frequently, whenever they, you need a favor from, from them, they'll give you a bill. Frequently, they prioritize you less it, because they're not happy that they had to give you the same thing as before, but for less money. In this case, it's it's the same thing as before, but there's additional value created for the supplier. And in return for that value, they're more than happy to make less. And so what the procurement professional has to do and what you need to have your people be doing is they need to be doing research. What kind of research do you do? Well, first, first of all, pre-negotiation meetings with the supplier. And I'll give you a list of questions to ask here soon. There has to be pre-meetings where it's discussed and focused on not only what is the supplier Really, what does the supplier want to achieve besides getting your money, essentially? What else is valuable about this deal besides the money? And here's the thing, you should prepare to be surprised. Prepare to learn things. Prepare to find new information. 
The second thing is you should be researching news articles about this supplier. And you have to learn how to read in between the lines. What is causing them problems? Where did they need to try and improve? Where are they trying to penetrate? Then reading executive interviews, seeing what the executives are saying, executives for that division, executives for that company, areas where they need to see growth, areas where they want to improve. You have to be thinking, how do I create value? Is there something I can do differently to help them out? Then analyst reports, what are the anal analysts identifying? Um, annual reports, what are the things, annual reports will always talk about the things that are working and the things that are not. And you have to go straight to the things that are not and say, do any of those tie to the business we're doing with them? Can I help them? Or potentially, you might be able to help make phone calls, even offering to make phone calls to somebody in a non-competitive industry. Tell the supplier, you do six months of great work for me and you give me this special pricing, I will make three phone calls to non-competitors to help recommend you in that industry. Um, looking at asking their employees. And interestingly enough, people think that the more senior of a person you talk to inside the supplier, the better answer you'll get. In my experience, it's the complete opposite. It's the more junior person that's more likely to, to provide information and to be free with the information that you can find out exactly what's going on. Then internet searches, of course. Searching to find out more about the company, what their priorities are, where their challenges are. Any internal documents you may have from prior negotiations, prior discussions with this supplier. And if there's anybody who has prior experience working with them or maybe even working for them. All of these are parts that we have to reset expectations because if the entire negotiation strategy is architected to say, how are we going to make sure we get the lowest price, then you are missing a really big opportunity with value creation. And value creation can only be done with investigative negotiations and research up front. And so it gets to this point here, which is we've been taught that the best negotiators, most neg best negotiators are good talkers. It's not true at all. The best negotiators are really good listeners. They listen carefully, they ask questions, and do you know what the three most powerful words are in negotiations? It's help me understand. When you say help me understand, it engages, it brings down the defense shields, you gather information, and so always focus on listening. How can I listen more and find out more? And so this is the biggest overlooked piece of negotiations, which is looking at what are the other side's prior priorities? What keeps them awake at night? You really have to understand this. And here's how you have to look at it. As you listen to them and you ask questions about what they're struggling with, what's working, where they want to accomplish more, you are developing currency. Just like mining for Bitcoin, you are developing currency. And this is how you have to think about it. The more you can find out about where they disagree, where they have challenges, where they're adamant, where they really want something, where they want to improve, all of this is currency. And why do I call it that? Because if you can help them in those areas, well, surely you won't do it for free. Now you know you've developed these things that maybe you can help them, but you'll say, what can you give me in return for this? What kind of discount can you give me? How can you improve my inventory model if I give this to you? It's all currency. And so that's how you have to view the mining. Just like with Bitcoin, you're trying to do mining and you're creating currency. Um, and then you're going to have to think differently about differences. And so with negotiations, we're frequently looking to say, to look for harmony between the parties and how can we come to agreement and how can we find out where we have all of our common ground. I'm telling you to do the exact opposite. I want you to find out where you have all of your differences. Every single point of difference creates currency, creates value. I'm not saying you can do everything for them, but you're, I'm saying you should look for the things where you can. And if they really are adamant, if they say, no, we have to have this, no, we have to have this, how much do they value it? Find out, because the rule in negotiations is 
Whoever values something more gets that item. The goal is not to win everything. The goal is to transfer assets in uh, negotiations to the party who values it more, and then you maximize what you get in return. I'll tell you a story that I don't have in this slide deck. One of my clients is in the cash management, management business and supports banks and many other businesses. And they had operations in Australia. And in Australia, it was very expensive to have armed people with guns transporting cash and going to the machines because the criteria for, having a, for being able to have a gun in Australia was so rigid, was so difficult, was so, uh, so hard to achieve and get approved for that the number of people who could carry, carry a gun was very, very, very low. As a consequence, these people were paid a lot of money. And so the cash transfer and cash protection business was a very expensive business that this, my client was operating in Australia, among other countries. But in Australia, it was so expensive. Then the legislation changed, and they made it cheaper to own a, not cheaper, easier to own a gun. The restrictions, the requirements, all of these things. And so my client went to them, and clearly they asked for a much better pricing because now their costs are going much down. And instead, this supplier, instead of saying, sure, we'll work with you, our costs go down, went down, we'll share it with you, instead, the lawyers got involved from the other side, and they started sending cease and desist letters and do not have these conversations with us, we're not interested in pricing discussions. Lawyers were sending these letters, and they couldn't understand why, and they kept saying, come on, negotiate with us, your prices went, get, went down, give us a better deal. Again, letters from lawyers came. And so they didn't know what to do. Then suddenly, this company got bought out by another company. And they found out. And then their supplier admitted it. After they got, got bought, they said, listen, what you didn't understand was we were trying to sell our company. If we gave you a big price cut, it would immediately diminish the value of our company. They would figure out that the market in Australia is going to be that our income in Australia for these services will go down dramatically. We could not entertain this discussion with you. Understanding this, they waited till the ownership changed. As soon as their new company was in charge, they went to them and said, listen, the costs have gone down. Please share that profit with us. And the supplier said, of course we will. That's the only right thing to do. Nobody, so it was the interests that were behind this negotiation that were impeding progress. You always have to ask questions. In this case, they were so adamant and if they're so adamant, there's something there. It's your objective and initiative to find out what it is. Another story from Turkey. I think you're really going to like this one. So, uh, of course, you have a very big textiles industry here in Turkey. Now, one of your textiles companies was negotiating with DuPont for many, many, many years for Lycra. And they weren't getting anywhere. Even when their volume increased, DuPont would not give a better price. They kept going to the negotiation table. DuPont said, this is it. This is your price. It's not going lower. And this company was pulling their hair out. How much business do we have to get them to give them to get a better price? And so finally, what they did, they said, we have to think about this problem differently. <clears throat> and they thought about it differently, and then they realized you know, in conversations with DuPont and through reading through industry research that DuPont had a problem with Lycra. And the problem was there's no such thing as, a Lycra, as Lycra clothes. You buy Adidas, you buy Reebok, you buy Nike. You don't buy a Lycra pants or a Lycra shirt, right? And so they realized that Lycra, and based on their research, it supported this, DuPont was concerned that Lycra would lose its brand value because it's going into somebody else's product with somebody else's name. So they realized, okay, this keeps my supplier awake at night. They're afraid that they're losing brand value because nobody's buying Lycra clothes. They're buying somebody else's clothes. How do we resolve this problem? And so this Turkish textiles company got very smart. And they went back to DuPont and said, we have a proposal for you that we think you're going to like. They said, what about if we start putting, marketing this product as being Lycra and putting a big logo in front uh, with your name on it? 
and DuPont got so excited. They got so excited. This is not the actual picture of what ended up getting used. What ended, DuPont had other ideas. They said, okay, let's really turn it into an advertisement. They said, let's have the Lycra logo and then let's put product characteristics underneath. UVA, UVA resistant, UVB resistant, sweat absorbent. It said all three of those things. And so I asked the lady what kind of discount she got for this. And truth be told, I thought this was not enough. She said, I got a 5% discount uh, for allowing them to put this. And I really thought it was worth much more. However, guess what happened after about a year? Can anybody guess? After a year, she went and looked back. Every single product she put this on experienced an average revenue increase of 55%. And a 55% sales increase. Those products that had this Lycra logo with the UVA resistant, UVB resistant, sweat absorbent, had a sales increase of 55% on every single one it went on. Look how much value was generated for both parties. And so it turns out the 5% discount was nothing compared to the 55% in additional sales. And of course, what does that mean? They had to buy that much more Lycra as well. So DuPont won in that uh, transaction as well. And so the message I'm sending to you, and I wanted to have some of these Turkish examples, the message I'm sending to you is you are getting paid to create these options. You are getting paid to do this research. You, it's not enough to get a tender and to negotiate price, lead time, warranty, and so forth. This is not enough anymore. You have to be creative and you must find out what specifically is eating this supplier, what is causing problems for them. And so the new paradigm, the new way you have to think about things is you have to get excited about supplier demands. And so today, we have this, uh, and it's really, I don't blame you. When a supplier makes all these demands, it's really tempting to just sit there, get upset, and say, okay, how can I get out of this? How can I avoid this? What strategies can I come up with to get out of these demands? Instead, I want you to get excited and say, what can I learn from this? Based on all these things they keep telling me, there must be a reason why this is important to them. How can I keep digging further? How can I find out more? And how can I build currency from this? And if they value it so much, if I'm certain that they value it more than me, then I'm going to find a way to give it to them, but they will have to pay for it. They will have to give me a very generous discount or something else that is commensurate with the value they place on it, which is more than the value I place on it. That's why you want to give it away. And in doing so, you're taking this tender with price, quality, lead time, warranty, and you're creating other options and more pies. And you're not just trying to squeeze this and get as much you ca as you can out of that bid. You're trying to make it bigger and you're trying to make the pie bigger. And so, Here's how it goes. When you're looking at the supplier's bottom line positions, what are frequently called the reservation values, it means what's the lowest they're willing to give, the best warranty, the, the lowest lead time, the biggest discount. You know, you can just ask them, what are all your bottom line positions? I wrote here, you can't ask, because you can ask, but you won't get a truthful response. Nobody answers that question truthfully. This is the lowest we'll give on everything. So instead, you have to investigate. Here are the things you can ask. Besides the revenue, how does this deal contribute to your division and company objectives? If it, what, else are you, what else is valuable to, to you in working with us except for our money? You must ask this question. Then you might find out, well, we really want to penetrate into Turkey, or we really want to get into this industry, or we really, you know, this product is struggling. What are the biggest challenges you're trying to tackle this year? And are there one or two thorns, one or two things that are really bothering you? So you need to find out what are their priorities? What are the things they're struggling with? What are the problems they want to surmount? What outcome from this deal would thrill your management and why? You know, you'd be surprised how many times I was in a negotiation and the supplier was more interested in how many years the deal was than what the pricing was. 
So I could give a three-year deal or a five-year deal, and even if I had termination for convenience, which means I could wake up tomorrow and cancel the contract for no reason at all, they didn't care. They valued the length of the deal just so they could tell management, I got a deal this long, much more than the pricing. It may not make sense to you, but it doesn't have to make sense. You have to do your research and find out what they value. It's not what you value, it's what they value. And then what are the top success metrics your group is measured on? You know, it's interesting, in the US, when you go to buy a car, a brand new car, one of their top metrics is what score you give it on uh, the customer service report. And, and so it's, I, and I always go at the end of the year to buy new cars because the other thing they care about is that the following year, the number of cars they get from the manufacturer is based on a, what scores they got on customer surveys, and B, how many cars they sold. At the end of the year, all they care about is getting cars off the lot at any price. At any price they want to get it off the lot, they'll lose money on the cars because their interests have changed. Their interests have changed. How would you rank your various positions you offered in the quotation in terms of value to your company? So don't be surprised if they rank pricing below something else. You have to find out what are the positions, you know, even if it's limited to the things on the tender, how do they rank them in terms of importance? And then you know whichever ones are the most important, if you give something away in that category, you can get the most back too, because you have their ranking and what they place on it in terms of importance. And so, you want to make low-cost, high-value trades where you're, the cost that you're incurring to give something away is low, but the value the supplier perceives that they're getting is very, very high. When you do that kind of thing, that's when you get the best sort of deals, where it doesn't cost you month, much, but you're gaining tremendous value yourself. And so, I had mentioned this before, but this is really, really important. The goal is not to transfer all the assets to yourself in a negotiation. The goal is to transfer the assets to the person who values them more. And you will never know who values them more unless you do investigative negotiations. And so the message here is loud and clear. I want to say it again, you are getting paid to invent options and negotiations. That is your job, and as chief purchasing officers, you need to impart this to their staff. They cannot live and limit their options to what's on the quotation. They have to think out of the box and then invent options, like what Ager did, inventing the options to let them use their customer service center. Don't assume suppliers are only interested in your money. Investigate not only what their interests are, but their problems, also what their needs are. Invent options that make the pie bigger. And then make sure we never give anything away for free, even if it costs you nothing. Make sure you are always arranging for a trade and you're getting a high value concession in return. And so what happens next is, is in your hands. Everything I've talked about today is actionable. These are things that you can start doing, and it's my request, my expectation, that as senior leaders, you have an obligation. With seniority comes accountability, and the accountability is to take these kind of strategies and act on them, and not only role model them, communicate it to your staff, and help create a new operating paradigm because there's money on the table that we leave every single day, both with the things we talked about earlier today and also with this. If you don't do this, you will leave money on the table with every single negotiation and your suppliers come out happier with these kind of outcomes because you've looked for other ways to make them successful. So with that, I want to thank you very much. I invite any of you to contact me later if you'd like to collaborate in any fashion or just discuss things. But thank you very, very much for having me in one of my very favorite countries. Thanks again. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Evet teşekkürlerimizi sunmak için şimdi sahnemize Tüsaider Başkan Yardımcısı Sayın Murat Altun'u davet etmek istiyoruz hemen. Sayın Omit Gamami bizlerle birlikte oldular bugün. Sahnemizde iki kez onurlandırdılar. Hoş geldiniz. Buyurunuz. Thank you so much. Evet değerli konuklar, 
Satın almada müzakere ile karlılığın artırılması konusunda bu kez bizlerle birlikte olduğu uluslararası satın alma danışmanı ve eğitmeni Sayın Omit Gamami'yi ağırladık sahnemizde. Bugün iki kez bizlerle birlikte oldu. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you again.